Hello and a very warm welcome to Mind Community. It is your weekly program that allows the Barbadians the opportunity to share that rich history and heritage of their communities and so enrich the lives of all of us. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. Thanks for joining us. Well, we ended the last episode on Queen Street next to the bridge door. Austin Husbands picks up the discussion at that point and moves it along in a southerly direction. But where the bridge store is now located, that was the butcher shop as well. And it was run by a man called Thomas Smith Chandler, who lived right next to the District E police station when it was on the hill. And Smith Chandler ran a, a butcher shop there. He and an old man who lived in Roeview, um, they call him Tony Jills. But he, he, I think he weighed a ton. But, uh, he, he, Tony lived in Roadview, and he and um, Smith Chandler, who I think was his brother-in-law, they, they ran this meat shop. There's an old story there about uh, one of the guys who used to go out and collect, you know, stock for them, and then they would come with this van. If I recall, the van was marked E120, the little van. Anyway. So it was one of these small uh, Morris or Austin vines with just a, a tray about as wide as from here to here. So they went to St. Andrew um, by Cleveland Plantation, bought a cow. So it was just to walk over the hill and come into Spicetown. So the gentleman who <laughs> shall remain nameless collected this cow. They didn't see him in an hour or two hours. They didn't see him in four hours to six hours. They didn't see him, so they, they drove up and went all through Bosco Bell, all around, driving around. Did not see him. Eventually, the next day, they drove, because they were worried now about what had happened to the cow that they bought. And my gentleman, well, they found it somewhere. There was no East Coast Road then. But they found it somewhere near Cattle Wash. So he said, well, you know, it was grazing. And it was grazing and pulling. It was grazing and pulling. So he, and he, he followed it. So, so they had to take the rope to the back of, of the van, right, and turn it around and drive slowly, right, uh, while the, the cow took its time. So they, they got into Spite Stone sometime late the next day. The disco. And that was a joke that we had on. Let, let's call him Sonny. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> because he was a very good friend of my mother's as well. And very closely attached to St. Peter Parish Church as well. And uh, uh, I, I'll say it over with that, but that's, that's, a, that's a standing joke on, on Sonny. So that butcher shop there um, has now become the bridge store. Um, right next to the Fisherman's Pub. The, of course, there was RMG Challenger, um, which is now the old man in the building that we, we talk about. And there was a jetty off there um, for sugar. So the people that were connected to the BS&T group, they shipped their, sh their sugar from that jetty, which was at, um, on the seaside opposite Manning, and next door to where the bridge store now is. We, we, we had fun times because you come know there's an old man called Elridge that would sample the sugar. So, you know, they'll stick something in, take out the sugar. And uh, so quite often we just pass by and say, you know, see wherever the hole is. You just rub the bag and you get a little, a little mouthful. Uh, <laughs> until, you wait until Elridge goes on the other side. So, but he, but he concentrated on sticking the bag to sugar that were, and that's, that, that was before the building of the, the water harbor, of course, when um, that sugar stopped coming out. Then further across now, um, about where Jordan's supermarket now is, right, just a bit north of Jordan's supermarket, there was also another jetty there. That, and that, that was used to ship, ship the sugar that came from the people that were connected 
to the plantations group of companies because you remember they were they were two separate. I don't know if there was any any hostility between them, but they had their and they would ship sugar from there. So they there's a storeroom. There was a storeroom where they already kept the sugar, um, and that storeroom subsequently became the cement bond after they stopped shipping, shipping sugar. There's also the Prince Alfred Lane, which runs right around and comes up through by the, the old public library. Um, and where the telephone exchange, the Spikestone telephone exchange started. The telephone exchange was upstairs on the second floor. And, and to the side of that was Archie Ramsey and Brown Bellamy. Brown nickname, um, Fitz Bellamy. There, there were tailors upstairs, and right next to it was the telephone exchange. Now the telephone exchange was a plug-in, and you would get a call come in. I think they had three numbers or four numbers, so you get 945, call anything, you plug in 945 and whatever. And the people that worked there was a Marguerite Skinner um, with her coat bottle glasses, and Mrs. Marvel, who was the wife of George Halley Marvel, who was then um, assistant headmaster at Spike Stone Boys School, subsequently became the headmaster of Spike Stone Boys School. And Miss Marvel was one of the assistants. And her daughter, Shirley, who now Shirley King, former um, personal secretary to the Prime Minister of Barbados, they, they, they would operate the switchboard. Now, I'm not going to say who did this, but occasionally two little hard ears children or three would go and, and plug in and put and listen to people's conversation because they, they, there was no privacy um, <laughs> at the telephone exchange. That subsequently moved and went to, to Roadview and they built a, built a brand new building up there, completely opposite and where I lived in Roadview. Mr. Marvel was there. Um, on the other side was the Spike Stone Library and Post Office. And upstairs, that's a three-story building now under um, renovation. The bottom was the public library to the north. My mother worked there occasionally um, when she could not teach, when she was not allowed to teach. So I would spend some time in there. And at the back, there, there was a garden where they held tea parties. Dr. Gilmore's wife, Kathleen Gilmore, she was very much involved in in the community as well. All four foot nine of her. But a bit of dynamite, really, really wonderful lady. Um, John Gilmore's mom. Um, she found time to teach French at, and English, first at Alexandria, then at, at Queen's College. Um, found time to get involved with every single club that you could think about in St. Peter. And then taught um, dance and, uh, and, and extra lessons. So I, you know, I don't know where she found the time to, to sleep. Uh, but her husband was similar. You could call Dr. Gilmore any time, and Dr. Gilmore would just come out, right? Um, quite often when you look, you'll see his pajamas and <laughs> underneath. <laughs> T.J. Gilmore, Terence John Gilmore. Um, there, there were two people that really um, gave a lot to the, the life of, of, of St. Peter. Um, then eventually he had his office upstairs, the old Noel Roach building. Noel Roach, another icon, another member of the parochial church council, pharmacist, um, druggist, um, at the doctor shop, as they call it then. He was also a very generous individual. His son Adrian worked in the shop, and his son Keith, the other, one of the other sons, Keith, um, also became a pharmacist. And they ran that, that shop until, I think, both retired. But Adrian is still alive now, um, 90 plus years old. The, the joke I had with Adrian, because Adrian always had a joke to tell. Somebody walked in one day, one precocious person said, Everybody's air conditioning the place. Man, Adrian, you got to do something with this thing. Adrian said, I lose all of my customers. Now, you know me, old people just come here and say, that can't take that thing. <laughs> but all said without acrimony. Adrian, Adrian was a storyteller, a real storyteller. Wannabe fisherman. 
Um, lo lo love fishing. I don't know how much you caught, but you just love fishing. That was on that side, North Roach, next to RNG, what was RNG, RNG Challenger. Became Manny Wilkinson and Challenger, then became Manning's. Um, now closed, now owned by somebody else. Right, right next door then was Barclays Bank. Um, I did seven years hard living in Barclays. From 1967, uh, I, 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 I always say that to them, you know, this is the only place I've ever worked. Because all the other things I've done, play music, water sports, I was getting paid to have fun. And I, uh, but I, the only place I had to work was at Barclays. Then Barclays was demolished to make way for the new building, because it was an old one, those old things looked, looked like a shop with three front doors. Like, like, um, like you see, that, that was part and parcel of the Spikes Down heritage, built heritage, where you'd have three front doors. All these buildings on here had three, three front doors. Right? And that, that's where I started at Barclays. And then you had to go down steps rather than go up steps. Um, funny enough, it never flooded out. Um, why were there? But you just went down two steps and into the building. So when that, when that was under renovation, we were moved then to beside the same place where Mr. Marvel lived. Um, that that building was our, our temporary our temporary building for about a year. It subsequently became um, a little nightclub, and then it was a, 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 a bread shop owned by. Bishop Marcus Hines, Bishop Marcus Hines from St. Lucie. And a bus came down, a transport board bus came down one day, caught fire and caught the shop. And wiped out the, wiped out the, the entire, burnt it flat. So when there was that other fire there the other day that burnt the other property, that thing, I thought, gee, this history repeats itself. Um, next to that was a man called Joey Edwards. There was another pharmacy there. And Joey Edwards ran this pharmacy. He was a very good friend of Mr. Aline, who, who ran the, the Sahili building. So Joey, Joey Edwards, and he was also a very good friend of mine called Val Boyne, who was a teacher by day, part pharmacist at night. Uh, he, Mr. Boyne eventually taught uh, industrial arts at Harrison College, but he, he taught carpentry at Spike Stone Boys School for a while. And he, he lived in the building next door to where um, Dr. Greenwich now or used to practice. So they, they, they ran that pharmacy. Uh, then next door to that now was the, the, the home of the original Alexandra School. And Elmer Jordan eventually lived there. Elmer who owned Elmer's Supermarket. He lived there. Um, the, the downstairs, um, he used that as a workshop because Elmer, Elmer was very much involved in pond boat racing. So he would be in there on his machines at night after he came from the, from the supermarket. And we would pass and chat with him and everything. He'd be in there making, making these boats and um, making all kinds of things. Right? He, had, he had the machinery and he would just be in there working at night till, till whenever. Because come Sunday, you go to church, leave church, and you could find Alma Jordan in the sea, right, with, with palm boats. Right? His son Charles also was a, a, skill, a skillful father. Um, Charles played music. He, he started a band called the Silhouettes. Um, included people like Willie Carr, um, Bam Marshall, who is now no past. Willie Bam. Being Chris St. John, playing bongos. Yeah, Foster was the drummer, really. Robert Foster. Um, and what Elmer, what Elmer would do sometimes for the community, he would bring the band down, set up a stage, and then they would play for the community. Um, and, you know, then obviously the snack it would benefit. <laughs> but but uh, Elmer, Elmer, you know, Elmer was very, very much involved in the. Uh, in the community life of Spikestown. And according to my father, as children, they used to rain, race spawn boats in the Spikestown Salt Pond because it was a much wider area and they had um, what, what we call reeds, the, 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 the gullet that they made perfect 
scout staves. So we will go in there and we will cut the occasional reed and, and use it uh, for, 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 for scouts. Um, so Yadi and Elmer, um, the late Bradman, who was a pond boat racer but couldn't swim. Uh, they, they were all as boys involved in this thing, um, very much involved in, in the pond boat racing in Spike Stone. This is Spike Stone. Right? It, it's mixed up between 6 o'clock and 12 o'clock, but that doesn't matter. Um, we, as, as we go farther south, there was the colonnade which subsequently became the Church of the Nazarene. At the colonnade were employees like a guy called George Hines, uh, who lives in the, U in the UK, and the great Lord Radio. They worked at the colonnade in Spike Stone. Next to that was Barbados Harleer, um, where Nancy, Nancy St. John from Ashton Hall and Patricia Rowe, whose father, Oliver, was one of the better known bus drivers in, 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 from, from Spice Town. Now, where Oliver Rowe lived, those houses have now been moved and they lived on the eastern side of Sand Street. Those houses have been moved to Church Street Gardens. On the other side of the road, north of Gain Group Shop, right, which is, um, there was Elise Pender's shop. And uh, other, another side of the house is going right down to where Hugo's restaurant now is. All that's there now is sand, and we've been trying to replant the beaches there um, so that the sand will accrete, will once again accrete. You know, all of those houses that were there on Sand Street, they all had a backyard, right? And a space behind the, the paling where they grew things. My friend, only recently I was um, reflecting with one of my friends who now lives in Canada, Van Cleese, uh, Rochester. And we were talking about what grew down there because some people were, were doubting us. We were on Facebook chatting. And people were doubting us, I said, where, where could these houses have been? And she then put up a photograph of where her house was. Now, we, I know that there was one of those houses down there had a little patch and they grew a few pieces of sugar cane at the back of the, at the, back of the yard. Because the rock that you now see there in Spike Stone, right, was you, at low tide, you could just walk, bam, and step onto the ramps without getting wet. Only your feet probably would get wet. You're going to swim to it now. So the erosion, but that erosion started sometime in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and then there are those who attributed all kinds of things to it, global warming, whatever, which we only know paying attention to. But those houses, had, people had to be recited, all of them. Um, and then on the other side of the road, it said about, okay, the make church street gardens into, because that was all part of Ford's, what was Ford's plantation, where the spike stone um, playing field is. Where the bus stand is, all of that was Ford's plantation, owned by a very talented man called Percy Whitehead. We call him Sheriff. Ford's plantation. It was next door to Haywood's plantation. And Haywood, there was a swamp where I remember people would come and shoot birds. So I would walk through the old Haywood's woods, right? That was another place that people were scared to walk. <laughs> I remember trying to prove that I was big and bold and won it. And I saw this hearse, right? And the guy slowed down. And I, I started to think twice. <laughs> anyway, I realized after a while, I think it was some chickens or something across the road, or sheep. Because Whitehead kept sheep out there, mainly in Fords. I don't know if you know how many sheep he had. If he would know, I, I doubt that he knew. I doubt very much. Because he had sheep running all over the place. So the guy with the, with the hearse had only just slowed down to let his thing cross. 
didn't mean that my heart didn't go up in my mouth, but uh, <laughs> let's call it an adrenaline flow. <laughs> the old Haywoods um, plantation house is not part of what is Almond Beach, right? I don't know if there was a, a plantation house. I can't recall a plantation house attached to Fords. But I do know that fur, um, farther up, sort of the middle of the station hill, out of the back, there was a Dr. T. Ellie Clark that lived out there. And that is part of, what was now part of the Morris Biopoly Clinic, that area. And I am not totally sure if that was a part of Fords that was cut off or not. But I do recall when Mr. Whitehead owned the, owned the trees out there because we would go out there. If you wanted dry coconuts, there were there plenty. There were loads and loads of coconut trees um, in, that, in that area that, you know, you could just go and pick up coconuts and what he didn't mind because there was no way that he could have sold all and there was not the kind of demand that we have now for coconuts. But he had a, a massive coconut walk out there. The sheriff lived on Queen Street on the other side of the road from where I was born. Um, his brother was a barber, Elder Whitehead. Um, then there was a, a kite maker who lived just a little bit further road. His name was Mr. Hudson, but of course you know his boys behind his back, we would call him Hattie Patti. What that meant, I don't know, but <laughs> um, on the other occasion when you pass there, you would shout for Hattie Patti and ran towards the long road <laughs> because you didn't want your parents to know that that was happening. Sher uh, Elder was a brilliant barber sheriff, as I said, was a very skilled man. Apparently he, he worked at the barber that's hungry as a youngster, um, but he was a, a locksmith. He was a mechanic. He was a welder a bit of a construction guru um, who designed the brick wall, which is uh, now attached to the Corbin School Hotel. What, what is now Corbin School? For years, the sea would just knock it down, um, you know, between February and between, uh, November and February, March, April, you get really rough seas. And that wall would get knocked down. He designed the wall with a curve. So the water would come in, go under it, and just go back out to sea. And that wall is still standing. Um, it's about the Cobbler's Cove Hotel. And, and old Josh Haynes, who was the owner of that house, it was then called Camelot. Um, we would walk, walk down, you know, to just see when the sea destroyed this wall every year. We knew, and you heard Josh Haynes' wall getting like down. And you, and you run down there, you know, that was excitement for us as children. And he, he designed this, this great wall, and it just kept the water from um, destroying the wall. Sheriff was also. Again, this is anecdotal. He went to a certain institution where the safe was jammed and he managed to get it unlocked. When he, gave, when he had told them what the price was, they didn't want to pay, so he just slammed it back. He said, when you're ready to pay me, you, you know, we can talk business. Of course, they <laughs> had to pay him up front. His, his son Peter is my very good friend to this day. And Peter had the Peter Whitehead Latin American band, it became the Gem Tones. Um, that's where I first heard people like Clifton Glasgow practicing and Jabba, Rav, Jabba Howard. Um, Sydney Willock, who come down and play bass. And Fern Trail, that eventually went and sang with Fantastics. That's where I remember Fern thing. And as I passed here, I saw the Caribbean come down. It clicked, because Peter would do a performance there for um, Reed Fusion every Saturday night, and they would record from the Caribbean roof deck. Uh, so that, that, that just came back to my mind, seeing the, the Caribbean now demolished. So Sheriff's son, uh, Peter, he had one of the bands. As a matter of fact, he was one of the people that encouraged us to, to set up our own band. Because um, he, he and he used to ride a bicycle from Spikestown to Foundation School every day. And ride back. It, it is amazing. <laughs> but he, 
he did that because he liked cycling. And um, when Peter came back from foundation, sometimes the, the school was finished at what, three o'clock? Peter would be in Spikestown in an hour. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> pedaling, and then still have time to go and practice his guitar. Professor Oliver Headley lived a little bit further along um, in the building that's now, it's now called One Queen Street or something like that. That building is been refurbished. And Oliver Headley and his brothers lived there for a while. Oliver was a genius. Um, and he and Peter Whitehead were very close friends. So Oliver would be experimenting and, you know, making these little things and brrr, you see a vehicle going along. And he want, he, then he decided to go into fireworks. And there was a rocket that he, that he I mean, so he, this rocket was supposed to go up and do whatever, blah, blah, blah. But it got stuck in one of Sheriff's coconut trees, which, which is where um, Schooner Bay is now. Sheriff lived in the house up front and then there were trees at the back. There's no Schooner Bay. So it got stuck in one of the coconut trees. And Peter decided he was going to go and retrieve it. The result was broken ribs. And Peter's uncle, Sheriff, not Sheriff, um, Elder, decided, I'm going to cut all, because he just loved, he loved Peter. He said, I'm going to cut all those trees down. So he, he got himself out there with a thing and a knife and a hatchet and a saw and whatever. That coconut tree remained alive until they pushed it down. Because he couldn't get past it because all the fiber. <laughs> he never got past about two inches after sawing and chopping the thing for about an hour or two. And then he realized it was an exercise in futility. But Elder was my barber, and he was the barber for a lot of the young guys down here. So too was Baji, the barber over there. But Baji gave you the more modern cuts. Elder believed um, in the traditional cut. As a matter of fact, I know of a fella who wants when to say this, just a little bit off the sides, right? I want the top, a little flat. Bring the muff up, and Elder said, yeah, okay. Get with me cheer. <laughs> Nobody tell me how to cut here. <laughs> but he was that type of a character. And I, I, uh, but he, he, like I said, he, he, he loved to sing. He had a beautiful voice, very beautiful voice, elderly. Um, so, it, it, you know, you're not often going to get a haircut. Um, and those were the days of the, 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 the machine that, that he used, the manual machine and scissors. So, he would be thinking, so occasionally what he would do is, and you, you would wake up, right? <laughs> he would just push the machine in the hair and just give it a little, a little yank backwards. And he, he suddenly realized, I said, yeah, just you had to decide a little bit so I could finish this bit. Um, but he, I mean, he, 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 he did it and he, he all, always found a way of, you know, polishing it up so you didn't, you didn't feel aggrieved. There you have it. Life, as it were, in the community of Spikestown, St. Peter, as experienced by Austin Husbands. I'm Sherwood McCaskey. This has been my community.